uh, more pleasant than I'm sure what Melissa is going to talk about. So um, uh, as uh, many of you know, but maybe not all of you, uh, the Delaware River Greenway Partnership is uh, also known as DRGP. is an organization that's focused on the Delaware River, um, which is uh, the area we focus on is, is defined by the National Park Service as the Lower Delaware, um, which really for us means about the water gap to uh, Trenton and a little bit south uh, to give you a sense. And we are uh, we focus on protecting and promoting the natural and cultural resources that the Delaware uh, brings to our communities. Um, tonight we have a, a, a very interesting. Um, I've watched briefly watched Melissa do a couple other um, uh, presentations. She's a great dynamic speaker. She's clearly very passionate about what she talks about. So I'm sure you will all enjoy this. Um, and what I thought about um, in thinking about this lecture is that we often think of history as something that happened a long time ago. And history is something that's going on all the time. And Melissa is going to give us a great example of, of exactly that. So this is something that's fairly recent, um, but has already become history. And um, if you're interested in the kind of work that Melissa has done, she has some great uh, training videos on oral histories, which you can look up and find. Um, Melissa, and I'm going to probably butcher your name. I'm going to try. Zio Bro. No, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, she's a professor at Monmouth University um, with a focus on public history projects. What I found kind of interesting is I actually um, have had a, a bit of a history background myself, and I have never listened or heard from anyone who began their career in um, the services as a historian. So she began at, as a command historian at Fort Monmouth. So that's a pretty that's a pretty unusual entry, and it's it's cool. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Melissa, and uh, kick us off, please. Awesome. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Melissa Ziobro. I'm the Director of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch. That's in Monmouth County, New Jersey. I am so honored to be here with you today. Um, <laughs> Allison noted that I am an enthusiastic presenter, and I have to say it's just because I really love what I do, and I'm so honored to help capture the stories that are happening, capture the history and share the history um, of this great state of this great region. So here today, in particular, we are talking about the 2021 Mullica Hill tornado. Well, if I used to work for the military as a historian, and now I teach at Monmouth University, why am I talking about the 2021 Mullica Hill tornado? Um, I do a lot of oral history work, right? And the Harrison Township Historical Society reached out to me to do oral history interviews with folks who were impacted by this storm in some way. So I wound up doing 20 oral history interviews for them with 32 narrators aged four years old to in their 80s. And we'll talk more about the logistics of those interviews in a little bit. But overall, let me tell you what I hope to do in the next 45 minutes or so. I want to provide a brief overview of tornadoes generally and Harrison Township's storm specifically. I want to tell you a little bit about the field of oral history and how it is uniquely suited to community history projects like this one. And I want to share some of the things that I have found in the course of my interviews because one of my goals with a project like this is helping us all be just a little more prepared in the event of a storm watch or warning. You know, we're just coming out of September, which was preparedness month, right? And I think that history is always at its best when it is helping us to better understand and to better navigate the world that we live in today. So 
Um, you know, how did the Harrison Township Historical Society find me? Like I said, I'm, I'm a public historian working throughout the state. I do a lot of oral history work. I have had the pleasure of doing over 200 oral history interviews on various projects over the course of my career. Um, and I think uh, Dr. James Turk at Harrison Township Historical Society found me specifically because of the work I had done to document Superstorm Sandy throughout the state. So uh, I'm so glad that he did find me because I think we've created something really special with this project. I did the oral history interviews and then the Harrison Township Historical Society also created an exhibit out of them, um, which was you know open to the community and anybody who wanted to visit. And the Historical Society's tornado documentation and interpretation efforts actually recently won the American Association for State and Local Histories 2023 Albert Corey Award, which recognizes small historical societies. So um, this project has really created valuable primary source documents for the historical record and um, you know brought a lot of awareness to this issue. So with all of that preamble, sorry, as a, an educator, I've got to give a lot of context before I can dive in. <laughs> with all of that information, though, let us go ahead and dive in. So tornadoes generally, and then the Harrison Township tornado specifically. I'm just going to do the basics, right? Because I'm absolutely a historian, not a scientist. I do my research. I talk with scientists, but I am not a scientist. So just the basics. The National Weather Service defines a tornado as a violently rotating column of air touching the ground, usually attached to the base of a thunderstorm. And they note that tornadoes are nature's most violent storm. Pictured here is a tornado in Kansas, 1902, from the Library of Congress. So tornadoes are spawned from powerful thunderstorms. They can cause fatalities and devastate a neighborhood in a matter of seconds. You see some devastation here in a Library of Congress photo of a bridge in Pennsylvania that was destroyed by a tornado in 1874. Or here's another photo from Kentucky in 1890. This one here is Georgia in 1920. The winds of a tornado can reach speeds of up to 300 miles per hour. Damaged paths can be in excess of one mile wide and 50 miles long. You might also have heard of strong downburst or straight line winds as opposed to you know swirling winds these can also occur uh, as a result of the same thunderstorm that might be causing a tornado so these are fast moving and very complex weather events hail is very commonly found close to tornadoes as the strongest thunderstorms that spawn tornadoes are formed under the atmospheric conditions that are also likely to make hail. As you can see from these stock photos here, um, hail can be quite large, can be quite dangerous. And as I said at the beginning, despite what everyone thinks, oh, it's never going to happen here. You know, that's a Kansas problem. The National Weather Service cautions that every state is at some risk of a tornado. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Centers for Environmental Information recently compiled a 20-year annual average for every state based on data from 1991 to 2010, which you can see on the map here. And if anybody is interested in my sources, I'm going to give you my email address at the end, and you can certainly reach out to me for more information. But if you look here, you can see the number in each state depicts the average annual number of tornadoes with the various colors representing the higher and lower averages. So Texas and Kansas average the most tornadoes each year historically. Other parts of the Plains and the Midwest also have a very high number of tornadoes annually. The Northeast and the West have the lowest number of tornadoes annually, historically. 
but it does happen, right? We see New Jersey there has historically had an average of two, although we'll talk about how that number has been going up. So some tornadoes are very clearly visible, right? This is kind of what we picture in our minds if we hear the word tornado, this very dramatic, very defined kind of funnel cloud. But rain or nearby low-hanging clouds might obscure a tornado at times. Um, tornadoes might develop extremely rapidly so that you don't see the funnel cloud in enough time to take cover. They often dissipate just as quickly. Most tornadoes, according to my research, are on the ground for far less than 15 minutes. Before a tornado hits, the wind may die down and the air become very, very still. We often see a cloud of debris that marks the location of a tornado, even if that funnel cloud was never visible. While it's not uncommon to see very dark skies, there could also be sunlit skies with a tornado, right? So again, a lot of variables. This is why we have to listen so closely to the weather alert information, the weather notifications that we get because we can't kind of just say, oh, well, I don't see or hear the tornado, so it's not coming, right? It's certainly not that cut and dry. So we've said that tornadoes can occur anywhere in the United States, though, of course, some places it's more likely than others. Well, when are tornadoes likely to occur? April kicks off what is typically the most active and dangerous three month period of the year for tornadoes in the United States. Um, we can have strong tornadoes any month, but weather history kind of shows that April, May, and June have the highest potential uh, of having the greatest number of tornadoes and also the most violent tornadoes in a given year. May typically has the most tornadoes with an average of 281, as you see in this particular graphic, um, followed by then June and April, right, with their respective averages. But as New Jersey has witnessed firsthand, again, tornadoes can happen any month. This is another NOAA graphic here. And I'd repeat, I'm happy to share these sources for anyone who is interested after the fact. So how do we measure tornadoes? The enhanced Fujita scale or EF scale, you may have heard of that. That's a rating of how strong a tornado was. I found this really interesting. Um, you know, back when I was first doing my tornado research, this scale, right, this rating is calculated by surveying the damage and comparing it with damage from other past events, other objects moving at similar wind speeds. So the EF scale is actually not meant to be used as a measure of how strong a tornado currently on the ground is. It's something that is figured out after the fact. The EF scale was implemented across the country in February of 2007, and it's meant to kind of help refine our understanding of tornadoes. This is a chart that is courtesy of the National Weather Service. Again, we're coming out of preservation month, but, uh, you know, preparation month, rather preparedness month. It's always good to be prepared, whether it's, you know, October or September. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between a storm watch and a storm warning. These are terms Maybe you're familiar with, maybe you can remember the difference, or you know, maybe you're someone who's got to pick up their phone and Google, wait, which one is more serious, a warning or a watch? <laughs> According to the National Weather Service, a tornado watch means, you know what, be prepared. Tornadoes are possible in the watch area. So just, you know, make sure you know your emergency plans. Like, do your kids know where are we running? If there is an emergency, which part of the house? Do you have flashlights ready? Do they have batteries in them, right? You're just kind of thinking things through and making sure you have a plan in mind if you need to act. Um, 
watches, uh, warnings rather, may be issued over a pretty wide area, right? It might cover numerous counties or even states, right? Because the weather services, the emergency personnel, they're trying to figure out where the storm is going to hit. Now, if you get a tornado warning, um, you know, then you really want to take action. A tornado has been sighted or indicated on the weather radar, okay? So there's imminent danger to life and to property. This is the time to move, right? Get into an interior room on the lowest floor possible, get away from windows, um, warnings, are usually issued by your local forecast office. They usually encompass a much smaller area because they're dealing with much more targeted information, okay? So again, tornado watch is be on watch, be on the lookout, be alert, be looking for more information. And a tornado warning is take action, get ready to take cover. So with that little bit of just broad background, there have been at least 182 confirmed tornadoes in New Jersey since 1950. Um, on average, historically, there had been about two tornadoes in the state each year. That number has been ticking up a little bit. This is a great interactive map. Of course, we're just looking at a screenshot, right? But it's a great interactive map offered by Rutgers which allows you to sort the tornado data in very interesting ways uh, for anybody who wants to do a little more information uh, searching at home. Now this here is a snapshot of the Rutgers data over the past few years. So as you can see in 2021, the year of the Mullica Hill storm, that's the focus of my oral history work, New, Jer New Jersey, you know, really blew past that average number of two with 13 confirmed tornadoes. Why were there so many? Scientists still really aren't sure. Uh, climate change is certainly a part of the conversation, but it remains to be seen if this uptick could be part of the new normal for our region. So let's move on to the tornado in Mullica Hill specifically. This is a map from the National Weather Service that shows you the path of the tornado that struck the community on September 1st, 2021. It was ultimately declared an EF3 at its peak. Again, this is the Fujita scale just to kind of show you where that falls. So it was a peak of EF3. In about 20 minutes, this tornado carved a path of de like total destruction. I, I still, you know, several years of working with these photos and listening to these oral history interviews, and I'm still just struck, floored by the devastation. So this you know, path of devastation cuts across more than 12 miles of Gloucester County. The remnants of Hurricane Ida actually spawned, spawned three tornadoes in New Jersey that night and four in neighboring Pennsylvania. The one that hit Mullica Hill, that was the focus of my study, was the most powerful of the bunch. It was one of five ever to reach that intensity in the Garden State based on National Weather Service records. Amazingly, this particular twister did not claim any human lives, but the storm you know, brought destruction to people's property and brought catastrophic flooding to other areas of New Jersey where people did die. Across Harrison Township, there were 39 homes that were either destroyed or had to be taken down because of the extensive damage, according to Mayor Lou Manzo. Let's look at just a little bit of the devastation. I always want to be thoughtful when showing photos of the devastation because um, I don't know if you've ever heard this term disaster porn that we, you know, have uh, this 
desire to just kind of stare at the photos and you know gape at them and and it's not really constructive but I think we need to look at least a few of the photos to really grasp how severe this was in order to prepare ourselves for the possible next storm so let's look at some photos of the homes that were destroyed um, many of these are courtesy of USA Today and other outlets so this is one community that was really hard hit, um, Josephine Lane. You can see literally the path of the storm here just by the devastation. This is another photo from Josephine Lane taken on September 2nd. You can see whole roofs were just torn off the houses. Um, cars were flung about, flung into houses. Um, you sometimes hear people talk about disasters and talk about how houses were left looking like a doll's house, right, where you could look inside and see the contents. And that's exactly what happened here to some of the residences. It is amazing what people were able to salvage um, from piles like this. There were stories of people finding their wedding rings or you know miraculously finding kids Christmas ornaments intact in the midst of all of this and maybe it was in their rubble or maybe it had blown a mile away and someone returned it to them um, but it's really to me so fascinating to think how fickle that was what survived and what did not because debris really was just strewn for miles and it made it very difficult to recover things, to recover some of people's most prized, most sentimental possessions. A lot of trees down. Um, I'll talk more about trees in a little bit. That was something that upset people really greatly. And I wouldn't have thought of that, but they were really upset by the loss of so many trees because um, that kind of wooded feel that more rural feel was really a hallmark of living in this area. And so the loss of those trees, which you just can't replant and, and have trees of that size and that quantity back so quickly was something that many people felt very, very keenly. Again, just some photos of the damage to the trees. In addition to people's private residences, like the photos that we've been looking at, um, you know, there were businesses impacted as well. For example, Wellacrest Farm, which was considered the state's largest dairy farm with more than 600 cows, was very severely impacted, as was the Grasso Farm. Uh, these next few photos are courtesy of New Jersey Advanced Media. You can see um, the devastation re you know, just on the outbuildings, just reduced to like matchsticks. According to some reports, the twister caused $53 million of property damage to 563 structures throughout the county, right? So we talked about the roughly 40 residential homes that had to come down. Um, these two farms that were really impacted they were the most severe, but there were, you know, other lesser degrees of damage that people all had to contend with. Of course, Governor Murphy was quick to visit Mullica Hill in particular to survey the damage. So the storm hits and, you know, it's shocking. Everyone is grateful that in Mullica Hill, there is no loss of life. And then people begin that very arduous task of moving forward and trying to figure out how to rebuild. There's no manual that the town or the insurance company can give you and tell you, okay, this is what you do. Um, that comes up again and again in oral history interviews that people wish there was a manual. Um, so as the community is in the process of rebuilding, even as that's ongoing, the Harrison Township Historical Society decided that they wanted to start doing oral histories to capture the experience while it was fresh in people's minds so they could preserve it for the historical record one and use that material to help other communities going forward. So as I said, I came in and I was going to do this oral history of the storm for them. So 
why oral history still? Like, why is that necessary? I showed you press photos, right? Um, Governor Murphy was there doing press conferences. There were news reports. Why do you need oral histories? So let me tell you just a little bit about the field of oral history. As far as oral historians are concerned, oral history has a very specific definition. It's not just any verbal testimony. It's not as simple as just hitting record. An oral history generally consists of a well-prepared interviewer asking questions of an interviewee, or we like to say narrator, because it gives a little more power to the person being interviewed because they're in the driver's seat. It's their story. I, as an interviewer, I'm just there to help them tell their story. So you have the interviewer and the narrator sitting down to chat and recording their conversation in full in either audio only or video. And then that recording in full is preserved for the historical record. Ideally, it would be transcribed also. Um, the transcription serves both a preservation and an access function. Um, you know, by preservation, I mean, well, we have that paper then, and we know paper lasts a long time. I don't know how long an MP3 is going to last, right? <laughs> um, and access. Ideally, a transcript is more accessible for a researcher to work with, or maybe you're going to post it online or whatever you're going to do with it, right? So recording and ideally a transcript. And we, as I said, keep it all. So when there's other types of interviews, a lot of these people who I interviewed um, were interviewed by the news, right? Local, national news. But the news might interview somebody for 20 minutes and run a 30 second soundbite and no one ever sees the rest of that interview, right? And maybe the rest of that interview even gets thrown away, right? I'm not knocking journalists. It's just different, right? And so... This oral history is kept in full for the historical record. And in the future, people can access it and maybe they want to use it in a book or an article or a documentary or whatever. It lives there for the historical record going forward. So um, oral history is really a conversation, right? I go into an oral history interview and I have a list of questions that I have tailored to each individual narrator. But we go back and forth. Um, I can't tell you how often I will be interviewing somebody and I'll ask a question and they might talk for like 20 minutes. And then they'll say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I'm rambling. And I say, no, like that's why we're here. You say whatever you need to say. Right? This is your platform to tell your story in your own words, however you see fit. So what are some of the lessons learned from these Mullica Hill tornado interviews that I did. What can we learn about emergency preparedness, about community from listening to these interviews? Um, you know, what are some insights that I can share? As I said, I did 20 interviews with 32 narrators. So obviously I had some interviews where there were multiple narrators, right? Um, usually I prefer to do interviews one-on-one -on -one. So there's no like group think or people talking over each other, but in instances where the material, the story might be a little bit traumatic, um, people often like to do it with a family member. And in that case, of course, whatever is going to put you at ease, whatever is going to make you feel as safe and secure as needed during this interview. Um, so 20 interviews with 32 narrators. And I said that my narrators were aged four too well into their 80s. <laughs> I normally would not do oral history interviews with children, but um, there were a couple families who wanted their children to participate. So I had some very, very eloquent teenagers who felt empowered by sharing their story for the historical record. And then some younger kids who were very, very sweet and um, families felt it might be empowering and cathartic for them to share their stories. So a lot of different perspectives here. And the interviews targeted not just impacted homeowners, but others who were involved in some way. So um, folks from the police department, from the school system, from local government, because they all have a unique and valuable perspective to share. So I think the 
biggest lesson we can draw from this experience is, not to sound like a broken record, but it's so important. Please, please, please take those weather warnings and alerts seriously. This came up again and again in my interviews. If we were in person, I would ask you to confess, raise your hand if you've ever gotten that beep, beep, beep warning on your phone and ignored it, you know, silenced it and gone about your business. I would be guilty before this project of raising my hand and saying that I've looked at the phone and said, okay, I'll keep an eye on the window. It'll be fine, right? Um, but again, remember, it can happen here and it can happen so quickly that you might not have time to see the funnel and take cover, or you might not see the funnel because of the way the storm is formed. So if you see those alerts on your phone, be responsive, be attentive, act quickly. As impacted homeowner Angelo Sacco noted, I would say to anybody, you know, regardless, if you if you think it can't happen here, you know, whatever the case, you may think your house is strong enough to withstand it or, you know, just always heed the warning because if we hadn't gone into the basement, we may have been crushed to death because the house wasn't leveled, but the amount of glass that was flying around in the house and the amount of debris that was flying through the house, people absolutely would have been killed. There's no doubt in my mind. So yeah, I would say to anybody, if you get a warning, even if you don't think it could happen here, even if you don't think it'll be that bad, you know, better safe than sorry. So that was something that came up again and again. Impacted homeowner Shannon Lynch noted, quote, after it happened, I say to myself, we're in Jersey. This is ridiculous. I've been here my whole life. Like, this does not happen. But I would say my advice to anyone is do not discount that. Be prepared have some kind of plan in place. I never would have thought, never, that it would happen here. Impacted homeowner Melody Randall recalls, quote, I never had that mentality to bunker. I never really had that urgency to feel like I really needed to bunker, but I do now. So I would kind of more be an advocate to kind of tell people how important it is to bunker, right? Know that space in your house. Discuss with your children, where is that space in your house that you are going to go if time is of the essence? The title of my talk is taken from my interview with Ashley and Troy Thomas, who huddled in their basement with their children just before the tornado destroyed their home. It was almost dinner time. The warnings were coming in. Ashley, who was pregnant, and our two girls did go downstairs into the basement, but Troy was still upstairs cooking dinner. He recalled how he saw the warnings, but he didn't think anything would come of them. As he said in his interview, quote, so I kept going to the front of our house to look out the windows periodically while cooking dinner. And the last time I went, I saw the funnel clouds coming. So he runs down to the basement, and Ashley shares, quote, I laid on top of the girls and he laid on top of me. And within, I mean, literally three seconds, I looked up and there was the sky. We could see the sky. There was no, from the basement, there was nothing over us, end quote. And yet, amazingly, as I said, despite this incredibly destructive power of the tornado, there was no loss of human life in the community directly related to the storm. That might be simple luck. It might be the time of day that the storm hit. Uh, you know, people were awake. It was around dinner time as opposed to upstairs sleeping in their beds. Narrator after narrator commented on how that likely made a huge difference. So no one should look at the fact that there was no loss of life in the Mullica Hill tornado and say, eh, well, a tornado probably won't happen in New Jersey. And if it does, it won't be a bad one. It won't matter. That's simply not true. As Township Administrator Mark Gravenice noted, there were, quote, no deaths in any of our towns here. But when you think about that timing of this, it would have been a whole 
when you look at the devastation the next day and following, it's amazing nobody got killed, to be honest with you. The Lord was with us, I think. Sergeant Neely of the Harrison Township Police Department said, quote, we were lucky as could be. I don't know how we didn't have any loss of life. The police chief concurred, saying, quote, yeah, if you saw some of these houses and maybe the one house was gone, completely gone, and the family just, they were in the basement, and they got up and walked out, and they were like, there's no house here anymore. I mean, big houses. We're very lucky that nobody was seriously injured or lost their lives. Virtually every impacted homeowner that I spoke with was so careful to say something along the lines of, well, it was terrible and it was scary and we lost everything, but at least we made it out alive together. I found that so very inspiring and I just thought it really, really demonstrated the resiliency of the human spirit. Um, the quote on the screen is from high schooler Isabella Maraca, who I interviewed alongside her dad, Steve. Their home was totally devastated by the storm. And she observed, quote, like leaving that house with just the clothes on my body that day, my phone and two left shoes. It's just really thinking you had nothing. But then really in the reality of knowing I had everything I needed when I had my family, end quote. Ashley Thomas noted, quote, it's not about stuff. And I have said that over and over, you know, we know we're so lucky to all have been unharmed. And, you know, the house is just a house and stuff is just stuff. And we're going to have a new house. But it's just our sense of security, too, is just, yeah, you know, it's not the same. And we all just want to go back home. And yet, despite um, their inspiring and resilient outlook on things let's not underestimate the trauma of living through that of losing your home and the many frustrations that follow it's not like the storm hits and it's this brief event and it's over with and you rebuild your house and next week it's back to normal uh, this is something that was going on you know for well over a year after the event and i'm sure for many of these folks is still going on um there were many things lost that just cannot be replaced no matter what your insurance company or fema or the town is willing to do for you one of the women i interviewed said one of my biggest devastations was losing my christmas ornaments that i've collected for years and years and years and every fingerprint and everything that the kids had. So there are some things that you just cannot replace regardless of how helpful your insurance company or the town intends to be. Um, this is another narrator who, you know, actually pretty quickly gets into temporary housing. And so that feels like a win, but then they keep finding the things that they're missing, right? You, you don't always think of it right away. Um, Melody Randall, for example, says, it's time for my son to take his driver's test. And it's like, oh, birth certificate. I'm like, oh no, I don't have a birth certificate. I don't have a social security card. I don't, and she continues. And then we wanna take the kids on vacation and we're missing a passport. So you have to retrace all that from the start. So right now, just before we got on the call, we were trying to prepare documents for him to go get, you know, to recreate a birth certificate so he can go take a six hour driving lessons. In another portion of the interview, Ms. Randall talks about how she's finally getting ready to go back to work because a lot of people were out of work as they tried to navigate the aftermath of this crisis. And she gets ready and she's going to go back to work and she wakes up that morning and she's like, oh, I don't have any uniforms. Right. So it's just kind of constantly getting hit with these things over and over and over again. So I referenced insurance companies. Um, there are some people who had a relatively smooth experience, but many, many people. And this is something I have seen over the course of many years with my Superstorm Sandy oral history interviews as well. Many people are just persistently frustrated by 
let's say their insurance company's lack of cooperation. Um, as one homeowner said, battle every step of the way. It's just been a fight. I never name narrators when I'm talking about um, insurance because a lot of times they're concerned about repercussions from their insurance companies. So I try not to, um, to tout that. Um, but one other homeowner says of the insurance company, quote, that whole process was very painful. And then just this past week, you know, they turned around and now are giving their assessment of what we said. And it's it was a real blow, to be honest. So it's just, you know, another fight. And I almost have no fight left in me, to be honest, because I just want to move on with my life. And I just I don't want to be nickeled and dimed by my insurance company. And that's, you know, how it's happening. And everyone says that's how it's going to happen. And we were really optimistic and felt that it wasn't going to go that way for us, but it seems like it's going that way now. So the insurance company is um, a persistent issue for many folks, not all, but many folks dealing with such crises. Harrison Township Director of Public Works and Deputy Administrator Dennis Chambers observed, but you know, there was a lot of people who suffered, I'm going to say mostly property damage and tree damage to their properties where their insurance companies just left them hanging saying, oh, you know, we don't cover this. We don't cover that. We only cover up a thousand dollars for tree removal. There was only one or two where I saw insurance companies really stepped up and helped people above and beyond. One tip I would share with you, the audience um, that's come up in a lot of my Superstorm Sandy and now this Mullica Hill tornado work is keep a running home inventory because in case of disaster, you'll be asked to provide one. And in the aftermath of crises, that's the last thing you're going to want to try to piece together. Ashley Thomas said she'd advise people to, quote, try to be better at having pictures and documentation of what you owned in your house. You know, I know that's like a thing they tell you, but nobody does that um, because we spent months we handed it in at the beginning of February, months going through room by room, trying to document everything we owned and put a value, you know, how much money we spent on it and how old it was. Well, some have noted that insurance companies were not really bending over backwards to help them. Uh, other impacted homeowners experienced downright nefarious actors as they attempted to move forward, mostly in the form of contractors. So I'd point this out as a real lesson learned in the aftermath of a tragedy to be really, really cautious of bad actors looking to take advantage of you. As Angelo Sacco noted, and you know, we ended up signing a contract with a not so reputable company. And you know, we kind of they were promising the world, you know, we'll get everything taken care of. Don't worry about it. And, you know, at that point, we were just concerned. We're just trying to get our property cleaned up. And he wound up in being taken advantage of. On a more positive note, almost all of the narrators I interviewed sang the praises of the local government and the community for the way they came together to support those that were impacted. For example, Janice Dugan recalled right after the storm, quote, there was glass. Matt got a saw and he's trying to saw this, the parts of a tree off to save our horse. And I'm holding a flashlight and not really knowing exactly what to do. And we turned around and there were six people with saws behind us offering to help. It was just like angels dropped from heaven. I'm really serious about that. We didn't know these people. We were way down. You couldn't see us from the road. Nobody knew we lived there. They just showed up and it was just amazing. As impacted homeowner Maria Stuber noted, the community response, quote, was absolutely phenomenal. We had people, you know, just showing up at our door from churches, community members, all sorts of organizations offering us help. Home Depot dropped off containers and tape and bubble wrap. And the local eateries like Naples Pizza, food plates, all like different cars brought food to our neighborhood, like food trucks. And it was absolutely unbelievable. I mentioned this before. It was fascinating to me how many narrators brought up how keenly they felt the loss of trees. Um, it was a cleanup nuisance, yes, but also they felt that it impacted their quality of life in their town going forward. Shannon Lynch noted, we lost almost every tree. Out of 400, there's probably 15 left. 
The little skinny ones lasted. All the big ones, even five foot around, all broke. The ones that I guess could bend didn't break, which was very few. As Joanne Trezera observed, this is a very different picture now, looking at our hedgerow where my house is compared to being here, you know, when I was growing up. It's just, it's a very weird thing. Everything's so different now. And speaking of the more rural history of that particular area of New Jersey, let me conclude my look at our oral history interviews by looking at the farms that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to refer to my interviews with Marianne Ekis and Lenny Grasso. Lenny's parents, Angelo and Sarah, purchased the family farm in 1957. And at the time that I did this interview, at the time of the storm, Lenny and his wife, Netta, were running it. In his interview, he shared fascinating insights on what it's like to be one of the few remaining farmers here in the Garden State and how even without the storm, it's a really hard way to make a living. He noted, we are dwindling in our numbers, unfortunately. There's a lot of, I guess, demand to live in New Jersey as we are our proximity to the major cities, you know, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Wilmington, we're down here in our area where farms are starting to disappear. So it's already rough for farmers, and then you have the storm. This farm was devastated by the storm. Lenny recalls how, after assessing damage to his home, quote, so we went over to the farm, and basically I just, I couldn't believe what I just saw. Everything was either heavily damaged or gone. We had outbuildings that had, for instance, a 30 by 60 roof, and there was no evidence that there was ever a roof around. It was just gone. He talks about damage to tractors and delivery trucks and greenhouses. Um, and Lenny and Netta had actually just invested a lot of money in upgrading their property, and it all gets destroyed. And then there was Wellacrest Farm. I spoke with Marion Ekis, whose in-laws had purchased it in 1943. Prior to the storm, they were milking around 600 cows, and they probably had 1,400 head total on the farm. They also grew around 2,000 acres of crops, and she recalled, as Lenny did, quote, New Jersey used to have a couple hundred dairy farms, you know, producing dairy farms in this area in the whole state, and because of milk prices and just, you know, development and you name it, Second generations didn't want to farm what their parents had farmed. The farms have shut down. So again, that recognition that even before the storm, it was hard to be in agriculture in New Jersey, and then the storm comes. So in this case, she talks about how overwhelming it felt to even try to assess the damage to their operation, saying the next morning, the sun's coming up over standing in the driveway which you couldn't even get down because there wasn't one spot on the farm that didn't have debris or roofing or anything it was gone and we just like broke down and we're like where do we start what do we do you know like what do you do and yet despite this unprecedented catastrophe striking the community the rebuilding started right away to the homes, to the farms, and for many, although they are going to retain very painful memories of the terror of that day and the difficult and, and lengthy rebuilding process, they also really retain a sense of gratitude that they survived and that they were part of that community. As Janice Dugan noted, for me, it's just the gratitude. It outweighs everything else, the goodness of people. As I start to wrap up this brief look at this particular case study in severe weather in New Jersey, I would note tornadoes are still happening in the state, right? For example, just April 1st was a Seagirt tornado. What you're seeing on the screen here is the former building of the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt. This is a building that was flooded by several feet of water during Superstorm Sandy. They rehab the building uh, and then it gets hit by a tornado, right? So hurricane, tornado, 
the severe unpredictable weather is something that we have to deal with and we cannot allow ourselves to say it can never happen here or it can never happen again because to help keep safe both lives and property we need to be informed we need to be aware so uh, with that, I've gone perhaps three minutes over the 45 minutes I said I would talk, but I will stop my prepared remarks there. Um, the educator in me wishes I could give a little pop quiz about the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning, uh, <laughs> but um, I'll stop talking and I think Cindy is going to manage some Q&A. Is that right, Cindy? Definitely, yes. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was very informational. So my name is Cindy Kunis. I am Projects Coordinator with Delaware River Greenway Partnership. And we have had a few questions come in. Also, please don't hesitate to ask your question as well. Can't have too many. So, All I can um, do is promise to try or send you the resource you need after the fact. So give them to me, Cindy. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So what was the most meaningful or memorable to you from this project? Oh gosh, um, having to pick between your narrators is like having to pick between your kids, right? Like that's very hard. It's hard to say which interview moves you the most. Um, but I think probably um, the Thomases, I think, I have difficulty talking about their interview without tearing up, without crying, um, picturing Ashley, you know, is pregnant and she's on top of the two girls and the you know really looking up and there's the sky like it can happen that quickly um so all of the interviews were really moving i'm struck by the bravery and resiliency of all the narrators but that interview stands out to me um something about the imagery of her um being pregnant a, a funny story is um in the aftermath she, you know, she doesn't realize you're kind of in shock, but she had lost her purse and somebody gets so excited because they find her purse like off wherever and are able to bring her purse back to her. And so there's this great photo of her standing up, holding her purse triumphantly. Um, it's just, it's, it's an amazing story. When I have students sometimes, you know, like say freshmen in a required history class and they're like, oh, history's boring I'm like are you kidding me right now history is full of the most amazing stories you know you just you couldn't make up if you tried so I'm um, sorry that was a long-winded answer to that question <laughs> well no history is always changing they're always finding new things and and now we're finding different ways to record it mm -hmm. so yeah it's, history is actually a lot more interesting than you know Washington crossed the Delaware at such and such date okay well then what came after you know yeah um yeah. and i think i think he people think history is boring when it has been reduced to memorization right like if you're in a history class in middle school or high school and you're just memorizing dates and names and spitting them out and that i think is such a disservice to history because it's so much more than that it's it can be just great storytelling which is very entertaining but it also has the power to inform our understanding of the world we live in, right? To arm us with the information we need to be safe or to be better people or whatever. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so do you want to comment on the better responsiveness of insurance companies? Um, I don't <laughs> want to. So I actually encourage them not to name names um, in the interviews because the interviews are public. So I encourage them not to tell me the names of their insurance companies. Um, so I can't say like, oh, this insurance company did better than this insurance company. I will say in my kind of disaster oral history interviews between Sandy and the tornado, um, people say, make that inventory. It sounds so tedious and so silly and I'm never going to need this, but why not have it? Work on it a little bit at a time. Having something in the event of a disaster would be better than nothing. So have some type of inventory and people always say get an adjuster um, to help you mediate that process in the aftermath of a crisis. Absolutely. You know, if you buy something new that's expensive, take a picture of it. 
Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like a running file. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be pretty, but God forbid there is that disaster. You would have something at least to help you. Uh, oh, so the, this question is about farm animals. So you didn't touch on what happened to the farm animals uh, after their farms were hit. There were, yeah, there were relatively few farm animals that were lost. Um, this was another really heartbreaking story. Um, one couple um, lost a horse and he, both of them, but the, the gentleman in particular, they were so devastated as they recounted how their horse died in the storm you know it was heartbreaking so that's funny I, I conscientiously say no loss of human life because yeah I meant to mention that there were a few um, animals who were lost in the storm yeah when I was reading the questions I'm kind of was not surprised <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing that the I don't remember the number um, of cows that were lost but it's amazing that it wasn't higher is what I remember thinking right in your work with Sandy, did you go back to the narrators and get a sense of long-term effects for the people? Ah, uh, so I teach an oral history class at Monmouth University, and one of the things we were just debating was, you know, do best practices dictate that you should interview somebody immediately after a crisis or you know, much later. So, for example, with these interviews, we were interviewing people, you know, roughly a year after this crisis things were relatively fresh um but at the same time i still i'll interview a world war ii veteran and it's been decades and decades later right so which one is better and i always say ideally you would want to do it immediately in the aftermath of the crisis and then follow up like 10 years later or something to see how their story ended up unfortunately that very rarely happens in the oral history realm just because of like logistics and bandwidth and time and things like that. Um, so as far as the people I've interviewed over the years with Superstorm Sandy, I've kept in touch with some of them. Um, Sandy was, compared to the tornado interviews I've done, that took so much longer for people to be able to rebuild on a whole um, than I saw with the tornadoes. And I need to do a little more exploring in this area, but I wonder if we learned lessons during Sandy that allowed people to get back to a sense of normalcy sooner in the event of the tornado. Of course, Sandy's a much, much larger event as well. So um, yeah, so I, I do manage to keep in touch with some people who I've done interviews with over the years, and it's always very gratifying when I get to do that. I mean, you really, doing oral histories, you get to know somebody quite intimately because you're having this extended conversation. They're often opening up to you on very private things. So it's always nice when I can keep in touch with my narrators. Right, you want to know the end of the story or if they're able to rebuild or, or did they completely move away? Yeah. You know, you get some disasters that are so bad. They're like, I'm packing up. I'm moving over to, you know, a relative in another state or, or whatever. Yeah, with Sandy, um, there were some people who just walked away from their homes, and I interviewed more than one person who fought and fought, and it took them years to rebuild, and then when they got back in their rebuilt homes, they could no longer afford the taxes because they were being assessed at such a high rate because the home had been fixed, and they had to leave their homes after all that, so, ugh. Wow, that's a shame. So, uh, any more questions? So I will go ahead and, oh, they can't see it. I was going to type my email address in the chat. But if anybody has any questions you think of after the fact, you can give me a quick Google and my Monmouth University webpage will pop up. If you wanted any of the resources I shared today, or if you have any questions for me, please go ahead and shoot me an email. Well, thank you so much. That was very interesting. You know, thank you so much. How many, how yeah. many more tornadoes we're getting now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.